Welcome along to the Salt and Sauce Show Season 1 Best Bits. Yes, folks, that's right. The curtain has now fallen on Season 1 of the Salt and Sauce Show. Now, we're working extremely hard behind the scenes to come up with new concepts to make Season 2 bigger and better, and that will be coming up very shortly. But let's kick off things by looking back on some memorable moments on the Salt and Sauce Show Season 1. <laughs> Our first ever guest on the Salt and Sauce Show, episode one, was stand-up comedian Gareth Walk. Now, Gareth grew up in the small Midlothian town of Roslyn, which was, of course, made famous by Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code, that was soon turned into a movie. And Gareth speaks very fondly of the day that Tom Hanks came to town. You grew up in Lonehead, you moved to Roslyn. Yep. Do you remember the day Tom Hanks came to visit? I do. Uh, I can't remember how old I was, but I remember we'd all stand at, like, the top of the road that leads down to the chapel. I was like, and uh, I remember he rolled down his window. He was the only one that would speak to everyone. And then I remember getting a photo of him. And then he pulled out a camera and he was like, I'm going to get a photo of you getting a photo of me. And I was like, all right, Tom, let's keep it going. <laughs> uh, but then my photo got put in the evening news. It was the front page. But it said it was taken by my mum. And I was fucking raging. Like, I remember being <laughs> raging at like eight years old or something like that. Being like, that was my photo. And she was like, oh, well, sorry. I, I was the one that sent it in. And that was, I think that was the first time I felt injustice in my life. Wow. So, I mean, I've spoke to people that live in Roslyn already and they've said Roslyn was a lovely, quiet little town until the day Tom Hanks came and it changed overnight. I, I don't know. I don't think it was a quiet town. Like, no. Folk, I remember that's when everyone went drinking when I was like when we were teenagers. Not me. I was in the Down cool the Glen, was it? Down the Glen. I was not cool enough to go down there. I never got invited. But uh, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't say it was quiet. I mean, it certainly got a lot busier. The chapel, like you noticed it there, like the amount of tourists coming in. Although we still never had a bus coming through, so <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. It was always kind of busy, from my memory anyway. Being an Edinburgh-based comedian, the Stand Comedy Club has played a huge part in Gareth's journey. Gareth discussed the importance of establishments like these and the impact that COVID-19 has had. Now, you actually tweeted something. You retweeted a tweet from The Stand recently, quite a serious oh, thing yeah. to talk about. Um, it was, the Stand Comedy Clubs are on the brink of collapse as venues mark an urgent plea for arts funding. So how damaging would that be to the comedy circuit if establishments like The Stand were to close? It would, uh, I think it'd be catatonic. Like, it would, it would be, it's, it, The Stand is such a cultural institution in comedy. Uh, and throughout the world, like, everybody in the world knows about these clubs. Like, I don't think people in Scotland realise how lucky we are. They're widely regarded as some of the best comedy clubs in the world. Yeah. And without The Stand, you don't have Frankie Boyle. You don't have Kevin Bridges. Susan Kalman, uh, Larry Dean, Daniel Floss. You don't have any of those people because they have the night on a Monday, which is Red Raw, where you go up and try new material. And that's where all these people like start started gigging. Frankie uh, spoke about it recently. Frankie Boyle was like, um, he did his first gig and hated it. And then they asked him to come back. And if they hadn't done that, he wouldn't he wouldn't be doing comedy. Mm -hmm. So it, it's hugely important. And the st they're such a good, they just treat all their acts right and, and their staff which I think is something that doesn't get spoken about enough. They they speak they treat they pay their staff a living wage, and throughout the whole of lockdown and all that, they've been paying their staff 100% of their wages. That's super. Stan treat their acts particularly well, particularly in the the fringe, when so many acts get taken advantage of by some bigger companies like uh, people. I don't know if you've spoke to people before, but comedians will always talk about how expensive the Edinburgh Fringe is for them. And that's like, they come up and obviously everybody knows that the prices of everything goes up in Edinburgh, but they pay for like accommodation, which is through the roof. And then the venues charge them, then you've got like PR. So some people come up here and spend like 10, 15, 20 grand to perform and then can come away with no money whatsoever mm. uh, if they don't sell X amount of tickets. I've always been quite lucky in that regard, whereas the stand give you a fair deal. If all the stand acts, if you don't, end up making money if you don't sell enough tickets, they cover the loss and no other venue does that. That's it. And the thing with the stand as well is it's, it's such a, a nice tight venue, if you like. And obviously with the whole COVID thing as well, with the social interaction, it's it would be it's a real shit. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's why it's good because of that tight, like that's how comedy should be. There's nowhere better to do comedy. My favourite place in the world to do comedy is the Edinburgh stand. It's just yeah. something about it. It's just got an energy in it. And tell me about cowboy beer. Have you had this at the stand before? Cowboy, Cowboy Lager, yeah. Yes. So I went one time with my wife now and I had a pint of that and I can't find it anywhere else. Is that solely for the Just stand? Just for the stand, yeah. So you can get the stand, uh, Newcastle, Edinburgh and Glasgow and nowhere else. 
Brilliant. Yeah. So if the stands hopefully touch wood, do open back up. Yeah. Get yourselves along, get a pint of cowboy beer. Oh, it's class. Yeah. It's Unbelievable. Great. Hopefully someday soon we can return to normality and venues like The Stand can hopefully reopen. Please make that extra effort to go to establishments like these, which we sometimes do take for granted. Whilst on the subject of COVID-19, Gareth went on to explain the impact of lockdown and how his girlfriend created a slightly, how would you say, out of the norm Instagram account? I mean, uh, my girlfriend as well has been adapting in lockdown. She's changed her hobbies a wee bit. She, uh, We've got a puppy. He's called Harris. He's a little uh, working cocker spaniel. He's great. Um, he's turned her into a lunatic. She won't mind me saying. Uh, she started calling me daddy, which I always thought would be cool as fuck. Right? <laughs> but it's to the dog and it's always dead passive aggressive stuff. You know what I mean? Like, she'll be like, oh, maybe daddy will take you out for a pee or oh, maybe daddy will, you know, give you a dinner. And I was like, maybe daddy will leave mummy if he keeps us up. <laughs> but she has made an Instagram account for the puppy. <laughs> Right. I don't know if you've ever seen these before. Yeah. Right. So I knew they existed, but I didn't realize how weird they were before. Like, because here's the thing. She posts um, as the dog, right? <laughs> like, it'll be like a photo of him with a bone. And it'll be like, I got a new chew today. So it's like he's typed it, right? And all these other dogs comment on it. Right? <laughs> be like, oh, you're a lucky boy. And I, it's so weird. Is this one of your jokes? Is it a bargain? Well, I, up well it's going to be eventually, uh. yeah. So, like, this is what she, she genuinely does all this, right? And it's all these dogs. Well, I remember asking her, I was like, um, why do you post as the dog? And she went, because it's his account. Like, I was mental for asking. <laughs> I was like, you fucking seen it? So, the way I found out uh, about the dog having an Instagram was I put up a photo of him on mine, and then he commented on it like below the photo it said uh, tag me next time daddy right and I, I remember like I was in the house with him alone she was like able to go to work and I was like it can't be you even though we've done <laughs> like it was just so weird it's so weird and it's always it's always cutesy stuff I went on a few of the dog like Instagram pages like one of our neighbours has got one as well and now they are pals on Instagram the dog and they like talk to each other about it and it's always like I said, it's always like puppies. It's always like cute. You know what I mean? It'll be like uh, a photo of him down the beach. He was like, I was, I was down the beach today. Hashtag Sandy Paws. Like, <laughs> it's, I don't know. It's never, it's never like an old bulldog. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like a really ugly looking staffy or something like that. Just being like, too many fucking cats in this country. <laughs> so it's never like that. And it's always a bit cute and weird. Well, you should maybe hijack the account and then just go a bit rogue on it and just say, went down the pub, got well, pushed. And... I, I, I refused to follow it for a long time because I totally didn't agree with it. But um, I, I, I follow him now. and I've Started kinda... sniffing the butt next door. Aye, <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, he, that would be funny. Well, this is actually, my girlfriend is kind of flirting with the next door neighbour's dog through that dog because it's a girl <laughs> and he's a boy and she's always like, oh, that's your girlfriend. And I was like, stop doing this. What? what? <laughs> You're mentally unwell. It's what's going on. It's like it's so weird, and then like they like each other's photos. They've started going for walks and stuff now. It's just bizarre. I don't get it, but it makes her happy. So who cares? Lockdown does funny things to funny people. Aye, well, more than others, some more than others for sure. <laughs> A big thank you to Gareth Walk for being our first ever guest on the Salt and Sauce Show. And if you're on Instagram, why not give his dog a little follow? Moving on to episode two, we welcomed Libby Emerson onto the show. Now, Libby is CEO and founder of Mental Health Charity Back On Site. An extremely inspirational woman is Libby. She was very honest in her interview about her own personal struggles in the past with mental health, and she went on to discuss the work she now does, primarily with football players who might be struggling. It's, it's changing within football because managers are getting younger, so they're understanding it a lot more and they're they're educating themselves and they've maybe been through something similar within in football so they've experienced it. Yeah, so if, if, if anybody does feel that way, like they maybe can't approach their manager or any football players, this is when you come in obviously, isn't it? And you can be that, that voice on the end of the phone to talk to. Yeah, and we're not part of the governing body, we're not SFA, we're not PFA. Um, don't get me wrong, if we have to work with them, that's, that's absolutely fine. But if a football player contacts us, we don't contact SFA or... Yeah or even their, their clubs or anything, unless they want that. Um, and it, we, we work with them, and it, it can take a long time for them to build up trust to then speak to our counsellor. But it, it does happen. And sometimes they don't need to, that's, they don't need to see a professional counsellor. Yeah. They just need someone to talk to, to see... To get off their chest. Uh, because a lot of the things 
isn't any to do with football, it's nothing to do with what's happening at the work. It could be personal things or their maybe parents get ill or money worries, anything. Yeah. Mm. Do you find any sort of trend when a football player like comes to the end of their career and they're not sure what sort of avenue to go down next? Do you find that? A... Yeah. yeah. Um, especially if they're a wee bit older and they've not like, looked at doing anything ahead of um, their career finishings. I think a lot of players think it's never going to finish. Yeah. And then you'll get the players that maybe get injured and that's their career over. And they're, they're still just at the beginning of their career, but they've not thought of anything else. Mm -hmm. So it is, we, we try and really push. We go into academies and things. That's what I was going to say next. Sorry to interrupt there. I was just going to say, what about like the younger players that maybe don't quite make the grade? And they've obviously, obviously got this aspiration of kicking on and becoming a professional player. And it maybe doesn't happen for them and they find themselves maybe down the lower leagues. Do you, do you get a, a trend in player like that that suffer from mental illness? Or? Yeah, they've had quite a few during lockdown. Maybe their contracts haven't been extended mm -hmm. and they're, they're really young. And, but we've worked with a couple of football clubs like they've kind of given us head up, this is what's going to happen, and they, they know they're already struggling. So yeah. we'll try and get them ready for the best case or the worst case scenario, yeah. if that makes sense. So when they are told, they're in a much better place, headspace, and we've maybe got some ideas for helping with jobs and things. Yeah, I mean, you touched on lockdown there. I mean, what impact has the COVID lockdown had on, on, on your charity? Have you seen an influx in calls? Or? Massive. Our calls have more than doubled. Um, just now we're averaging about 72 calls a day. Wow. Um, and right at the beginning of lockdown, it was just over 150 a day. A big thank you to Libby Emerson for coming on the show and being so open with us. What a great interview Libby was. Now, if you want to find out more information about the work that Libby does and her charity Back On Side, please visit their website. It's www.backonside.co.uk. You can also find them on all the socials as well, on Facebook, on Twitter and on Instagram. Moving on to episode three, we welcome Scottish football writer Anthony Brown onto the show. Anthony was a great interview as well. I mean, everybody's been great. Anthony was superb. He talked in length about his career as a Scottish football writer, especially the time that Neil Lennon was unveiled as Hibernian manager. The whole, probably the whole month, right through into June, you had Stubbsy leaving. And I remember going down to Rotherham to see Stubbsy's, I'm calling him Stubbsy, but Alan Stubbs. Yeah, yeah. I've gotten really well well, and that's probably why I call him that. But, um, mm. And I thought he was a really good Hibs manager. I know some Hibs fans were a bit disappointed they didn't get them promoted, but I thought he, he built that team that yeah. then went on and did quite well under Neil Lennon. So I was down in Rotherham covering his unveiling, um, him and John Doolan, and then that same day, the Neil Lennon stuff was starting to gather pace. So Was it right back up the road after that? Well, I, was on the, I remember being on a train. I was on the train from Rotherham to wherever you have to change on the main line. It was maybe, was it York or Doncaster? So I'm sitting at York or Doncaster typing up my Alan Stubbs interview from a meanwhile sports editor, Mark Kack, I was at Namsey, one of my sports editors was on the phone saying, Lenny Hibbs, is, there's murmurs of that, can you check it out? So I got in touch with his agent, got stood up that he was going for talks. And uh, so as soon as that kicks off, you're like, wow, Hibbs, Neil Lennon. I mean, even though Lenny was maybe not the guy, he, he'd just come out of Bolton, so he wasn't uh, sort of, a guy who was at the very ah, top, but yeah, he was still yeah. Neil Lennon, yeah. Celtic legend, Celtic manager, sort of titan of Scottish football. And I'm thinking, surely Neil Lennon's not going to come and be the Hibs manager in the first in the championship. So as it transpired, he did become the Hibs manager. I remember his his press conference. It was like box office sort of stuff. He had it was a roasting day at Easter Road and. Uh, Sun's beating down Lenny's in his suit, bright red, <laughs> beetroot red, just, and he's having to do all these interviews. Moving on from our discussions on Anthony's football writing career, we then discuss the book that he's about to release, reminiscing on the famous 1998 Heart of Midlothian Scottish Cup win. Well, as I touched on, obviously it was a period when I was going to watch Hearts, probably the last year that I would say, I'm, I mean, don't get me wrong, I still want Hearts to do well, my wee boys and Hearts and stuff like that. But probably my last year of being a proper regular Hearts fan, if you like, and obviously it was a sensational season. And I've always wanted to write a book. It's always something that's been at the back of my mind. I've had a few moments where I've thought, oh, I quite fancy doing this or that, but it's never really, I think two things with writing a book, it's got to be something you're passionate about, passionate about rather, and something that you know that other people are going to want to, to read yeah. and buy. Um, and the other ideas I've come up with, even though there were things that interested me, I just thought, is there going to be a market for it? And nah. Um, so with this it was 
very much a case of what have I done in my career so far or what has happened in my sort of football follow because I was only ever going to write about football really I mean yeah. I'm not I'm quite one dimensional that way I'm very football orientated um, so I think it would, if I was going to write a book it was always going to be on football um, so I'm thinking about the moments in my life that have been big that I've got genuine sort of knowledge or insight on and in terms of Hearts and Hibs career moments. You go back to the 2012 Cup final, Hearts beating Hibs 5-1, and as I said, Hibs winning the Cup. But mm. The one that just pulled me in was the, I thought, Hearts 1998, because I thought, even though I was there and I know the whole story in terms of who played in the Cup final, who they beat on the way, I thought, there's a lot of little backstories that I don't really understand, little bits and pieces that I've sort of, just maybe because I was only 15 at the time, but I think... I think even adults will probably not have maybe contextualised the whole thing at the time. Like, how did that team come together and what was the... I just feel like there's so many different bits and pieces, different strands that all need to be sort of relived and brought back together and just confirmed almost. And you've in, pulled that all together in, in your retrospective, book. yeah. It was a great privilege having Anthony Brown as a guest on the show and his book is available on the run-up to Christmas. It's going to be out very shortly. If you'd like to pre-order or buy his book, it is available at legends98.bigcartel.com. You can obviously follow Anthony as well on Twitter. It's at Anthony A. Brown. Follow him, find out information on the book. It is a must-have for any jambo out there. So like most people, this year has seen a lot of us working from home and in case you haven't put two and two together, this is live in my living room. The dog's sleeping down there if it must. So it's a new norm. We've got to get used to it. But I have to show you around the home of the Salt and Sauce Show. This is my house. Let me show you my second home. This is the state of my studios where the Salt and Sauce Show happens. So this is where the magic happens. This is home of the Salt and Sauce Show, the state of mind studios. This is where I normally sit. This is where my guests normally sit. So yeah, I mean, this is where the magic all happens. I'll give you a little tour of the studio. We have got motorbikes, scooters, Vespas up here. We have got more, if I just do a camera angle, up here with sidecars. This place is a museum. What a great backdrop to record anything really to be honest and that's what we are we are a state of mind this is our studios and we are home to numerous different podcasts different online shows like i say salt and soft show happens in here if you're a celtic fan you'll know that this is home of a celtic state of mind with paul john dice and it happens in here in this studio what a backdrop this is for a podcast to be recorded. So Celtic State of Mind happens in here. We've also got our soul show, which goes out every fortnight, Underground Grooves, which is recorded here. Brilliant show. Make sure you check it out. We've got the Porty Boot Room, which is a new one. Portobello Boys Club with Scott Bonner and loads of guests. The Porty Boot Room, right in front of this backdrop. Honestly, so much going on. And if you're in your gaming, we've got Game Changers, which happens as well, which is right here. And that is a quick tour of where all the magic happens here at State of Mind Studios. How about that for a studio? That's home of the Salt and Sauce Show, the State of Mind Studios. It's an absolute gem of a place and I'm very proud to be part of it. Moving on to episode four, we welcomed Edinburgh City Manager James McDonough onto the show. Now Edinburgh City are a side who have benefited from the SFA Pyramid Scheme. And here's what James had to say about that. I think it is a good thing. I think it could be even more of a pyramid scheme if I'm being honest, I think. There's a wee opportunity there with recent times to, to change it and maybe it wasn't the best time to change it, maybe it was, who knows. We'll never know, it's not been changed, but I think the way Scotland is and the amount of money that, that goes out of the game in terms of travel, me personally, I would love to see two full-time leagues and then regional leagues below that feeding into the Championship. I think, like, so you look at our league next season, you've got Annan, Stranraer and Elgin could easily have been sort of cove in that league, the, the travel and, you know, bus companies are making more than, than the football clubs at times. So, for me... I would like to see more of a pyramid system and maybe some sort of you know three or four regions under the the championship and then a playoff system you know, just to make it a wee bit more exciting. I think the playoffs have worked. Edinburgh City obviously have benefited before I came to the club in getting up, and um, as you mentioned, there Kelly will be you know a feel for them. I think. Yeah. Although you know their league wasn't finished, they got awarded the league as did Broder, so maybe you know Borrig might have something to say about that as well. But yeah. I think for nothing to have happened. Um, was really unfortunate and you could go the same with us. I mean, Cove were deserved winners and never say anything against them. They were, they were really good all season, but equally, we had them to play at home. We'd already beat them at home. We had a game in hand. We could have got it down to seven points behind with seven games left and anything can happen. So that's it. It was a bit unfortunate. 2020, the year of ifs and buts, isn't that's it? That's right. I know it's just unfortunate we never got the, the chance to 
to participate in the playoffs, but I think the pyramid system is a good thing. I think it could be even better if it was, if it was uh, adjusted as well. James has a great CV in football and he's a UEFA Pro Licence holder as well. His football journey has seen him from taking the Hibernian Academy on to assistant manager at Falkirk, where he led them with Peter Houston to the 2015 Scottish Cup final. James went on to discuss his current managerial role at Edinburgh City and here's what he had to say. So uh, you came in, like you said, in, in place of Gary Jordan and you managed to keep the team up that year, didn't you? Uh, it was really difficult. Um... The team that inherited had obviously done great to get them there, but it was a real eye-opener for me and in hindsight I probably wouldn't have taken the job to be fair once <laughs> I had seen what I'd seen the, the first couple of months and it was just step by step. I think um, we took a, a few games, to maybe a couple of games to get a goal which was which was a progress and then win a game type thing, but um, you know I've been three years there now and for a, a first job in management there's not many managers last three years in their first job so exactly kind of quite chuffed with that and you must be doing well because you've won manager of, the month, manager of the month sorry in September 2018 and in December 2019 I know and I should have got an R five times as well but they never gave me it but no I'm only, <laughs> I'm only joking no, uh, uh, I, it's, uh, that was a proud thing to be to be selected as that um, as manager of the month uh, twice so hopefully get it again this year brilliant would you say what sort of club are Edinburgh City? Basically, are they an ambitious club? Are they happy just being where they are? Or do they strive to be like Cove that have progressed up to the next division? Or Yeah, I think they're, they're very ambitious. Um, it's just going to be difficult how to, to progress it again. They've got a new owner coming in. The chairman's done a lot of work. The board have done a lot of work. They've moved on in the three years that I've been there. Um, I think that's been one of the, the good things for me. I've been able to build a club. A lot of managers these days are head coaches or the first team coaches. And they, they're told to just do their work on the pitch, whereas I've being able to sort of build the whole club, um, backroom staff and how we run things and professionalism. Um, mm. So that's been good for me. I've been actually able to manage as well as coach. Mm -hmm. So I always remember um, Edinburgh City, their home ground was Meadowbank Stadium, which is obviously no longer there now, it's been demolished. And you've been ground sharing with Spartans at Ainsley Park. Is that a long-term thing for the club? Is that going to be your new home from now on? Or is there plans to move back to Meadowbank or have your own ground? or? Well, I don't think going back to Meadowbank will happen. I mean, maybe I'm talking out of turn there, but I don't think it will happen. Um, I think going to Spartans, we're committed for another year. Right. But I think long term, you know, the club are ambitious. They want their own ground, they want their own uh, stadium, if you like, and they want to, you know, put a bit into the community as well. So they want to tie in a, a, maybe a youth academy. There's a lot of, there's like four, over 400 kids play for Edinburgh City every week yep. um, in the juvenile setup. So. They want to bring all that together. Um, part of my role in the last couple of years has been going out at nights and helping the coaches there. So I think the club want to get their own home, preferably at some point, and uh, bring the community together, bring the young team together, get the first team a base, and try and be the best, the best they can. The best. Uh, I was going to say in the city there, but better just stick with, <laughs> better just stick with the third best in the city. Yeah. A huge thank you to James McDonough for coming on to the show and being guest number four on the Salt and Sauce show. Really enjoyed our chats both on air and off air. Great football man and he certainly knows his stuff. On to episode five, we welcome former Sergeant frontman Nick Mercer onto the show. Nick talks to us about how his band got signed by another famous record label to another famous Scottish band. You might have heard of them. He also went on to say how he almost supported Pete Doherty on his Scottish tour. 2006, a manager came in who was the manager of the Fratellis at the time. So they'd just won a Brit Award and then sold two million records. And so we basically took all of, well, not all of the Fratellis' money, but he invested quite a lot of it into us off the back of that. And it was him that basically managed us to, managed to get us into like the actual industry, like wow. the actual music industry. Wow. So yeah, we're going to talk about um, how you kind of toured with the Fratellis and mm. we'll talk about about Oasis as well. But, um, you supported them, like I say, we'll talk about that very shortly, but there was also almost an occasion when you almost supported Pete Docherty in the Libertines, wasn't there? Yes, there was, yeah. Tell us about that. Funny story, that one. <laughs> so, um, I like it was just total DIY. Everything was DIY at that point. So it was like you, you would just do anything to try and kind of get a leg up, so to speak. So I used to always, when I used to go and watch bands, and take, I'd always take CDs to gigs, remember them. <laughs> and um, I'd throw them... I'd like literally just throw them on the frisbee stage. them, yeah, frisbee them, and and see what happened. Most of the time, nothing did. But I went to see Baby Shambles in Aberdeen on a Thursday night. Um, that would have been about two thousand five, I think. And then, yeah, I threw a CD on the stage, and then he came back out at the end and was like, "Who's is this?" He'd been listening to it in the back of the, 
the back of the the the, the venue and um so i'm like ah it's mine and um he was like sing it so i know it is yours i was like sang the song he's like cool and uh go back and he was like you could support us tomorrow night in dundee wow so i had to phone all my mates the three band mates and um they were all still in school and basically they just never took a half day so we never got there in time and then the meanwhile the the view had been in dundee that night and then the view got the gig so that was like the first of us meeting them and it was like the first of us both kind of going off into this little this little world and uh so did, did they follow the same suit as you did they just hand them a seat yeah, CD? yeah exactly that's what everybody did yeah so he must have just been doing it every night yeah to do, everywhere he went he'd be like yeah you can play you can play you can play you can play sort of a local support like i suppose yeah, yeah. isn't it yeah, yeah. brilliant Next band Sergeant went on to tour with the Fatellis and also Oasis as well. Remarkable, great stories there, especially the time that he managed to grab Liam Gallagher's leather jacket and maybe how he still wears it to this day. He also talks fondly about the future of Oasis and he has a bit of a good outlook on how that might pan out. You toured yeah. the whole of Scotland with Oasis. Yeah. How has that been so close to, to Liam and Noel working alongside them? Everyone asks that question and it's just exactly how you'd imagine it to be. It was like the best. They were great, like uh, very accommodating. And um, they had asked us to do the tour as well. So it wasn't like, uh, so sometimes you actually get buy-ons, like you pay to go on tour. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So bands will like approach artists and say, oh, yeah. can we support you? Yeah, yeah, literally. Because it's just another way of the artists making money. Right. So you get a lot of that stuff going on. And um, But with them, like they actually came came to us and asked us to go on tour with them. So that was that was quite nice. And they stood there every night and watched from like the side and they were like eat what you want drink what you want go in whatever room you want it was just pretty open open space did they give you any feedback on your gigs like you said they were watching did they say oh mm. this song was really good maybe try this maybe did they give any sort of not feedback? so much yeah they were just like that's great it's great just love it's it great awesome keep going keep working sort of thing great so when was this about 2008 would you say yes that's so right so oasis yeah. obviously split in 2009 didn't mm. they did you were you aware of any sort of friction between the guys when you're um, so close to them or i mean Nah, there wasn't nah. too much. Nah, I, I personally think it's all one big massive con. Oh really? A big conspiracy? Yeah. Are they yeah. just gearing up for a big massive reunion? I reckon, I reckon Noel Gallagher seen how much money Take That made around 2006, 2007 with their comeback and thought, what are we doing trudging along here doing this? Because it's always been about their relationship. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd probably watch this space. There's no way they're never not going to get back together. Absolutely wow. no way. That would be some tour, wouldn't it? Oh. That's of course, of course, it's going to happen. You should go and support them on that one, wouldn't oh, you? I'd love it if they asked. Because <laughs> I, I mean, I've been doing a bit of research. I've listened to a few other interviews you've done, and I've, yeah. I've obviously got the, the power of having Google. There was a good story about Liam Gallagher's leather jacket, wasn't it? And how you mm. obtained it? I still wear it to bed every night. <laughs> Wrapped up in a little Liam blanket. Yeah, it's hanging up in my. It's just hanging up in my wardrobe. It fits me now. It didn't fit me twelve years ago. <laughs> so how did that happen? How did you end up with his leather jacket? Ah, uh, we're just standing there and um. I think I'd said something like, oh, it's a cool jacket. Do you know, like those awkward silences when you meet your heroes and you're like, cool jacket, man. And then <laughs> he was like, oh, try it on. And then I put it on and it was like down to here, drowned me. And he was like, oh, it looks really cool. And he's like, just keep it. And that was it. And I was like, oh, wow, thanks very much, man. <laughs> <laughs> no one else will let you touch it. <laughs> no one's let it. It's actually quite funny because that night, obviously we had a bit of a party each of those nights. And I went, uh, we went back into Glasgow and I ended up staying at a hotel room where where my mates were staying and I'd obviously like taken my jacket and that off and uh, I wake up in the morning and uh, my mates like sitting there eating a bacon roll with like the newspaper and I was like oh you already been away and he's like aye man and he hadn't told me but he had been he'd been out wearing his wearing the jacket just walking about <laughs> the streets at like eight in the morning in Glasgow just like yes <laughs> and I'm, I'm sound asleep in bed probably raging that he'd done it <laughs> Some amazing stories there from Nick Mercer, unbelievable. After the band Sergeant came to an end, Nick done a bit of traveling and he found himself spending some time down in London where he actually ended up bumping into an old friend of his. Um, I, like I say, I did quite a bit of research on you. You, you worked in Covent Garden mm. um, and you had a wee bit of a, a meet with an ex-friend, so to say. Yeah, I worked for Pretty Green in Covent Garden. So um, obviously that was, Liam's, that was Liam's shop. It's not anymore, but it was. And um, yeah, there was one night where they'd done like a, they had like a meet and greet for like a fan, like a super fan, and he'd won the competition. And then 
uh, someone was like, Nick, you're staying behind to run the shop when this is ongoing. I was like, awesome. And um, so the super fan comes in. He's got his prize shopping spree with Liam Gallagher. And then obviously Liam and that turn up. And uh, Liam's standing looking at me going, I know you. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, man. I didn't say anything. I was just like, he's like, don't tell me, don't tell me. And he goes, oh, you're that guy from that band. That, and then it, it was like he had a brief moment of like looking at my staff badge. And he's like, what the are you doing working in this shit hole? <laughs> and he's like pulled my pulled the um pulled the staff badge off through it and he was like, You should be doing music. And I was like, All right, cool. So I did. I pretty much left after that and um went back to kind of singing for a living, singing songs and pubs and just anything. I yep. just go back to my dad always my dad was always like, You've you've made a trade for yourself, so why are you not doing it? So Exactly. I just went back to doing it. Superb. So if it wasn't for Liam, you might still well be working. Yeah, I know. It was a long stint in that shop. Well, wow. but um, no, nah, it was good. It was full of good people, and um, that was it was a change of scenery from years previous. So it was good, man. I loved it. We will see more from Nick at the end of the show. But moving on to episode six, we stick with the music scene, and we welcomed on to the show two fifths of Fife Band Dancing on Tables. These guys are going to absolutely smash it. They've been voted as the top 10 Brits to watch and they went down to a ceremony to celebrate this and they tell us some stories of how that event bash went. <laughs> so yeah, top 10 Brits to watch. How was that? That was mental. Yeah. It's very funny. It was, um, so it's Variety Magazine named us um, just out of the blue. I just got an email saying that they'd picked us. Um, but it was like people in... You know, there was film and other singers and just like people from all all walks. Um, I always found it quite funny because there was five of us, um, but it was ten, 10 Brits to watch, but they kind of encompassed us all as one. Um, and we went down to London for the, the awards and like we were like hanging out with Simon Pegg for ages and like, all these massive film stars and everybody wanted to chat. So was it still, like a big fancy hotel or was it? Yeah, yeah. The craziest hotels I've ever seen. This like felt very out of our depth. I don't think we realised what it was going to be like. But nah. he, Hamish, the guitarist, spilt his wine over the head of BAFTA, um, over his shoes, um, which I always think that. Well, I don't think he maybe remembers. But I remember because <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to die. Yeah. And that's probably one of the events where you probably never bought a drink that night. I'd imagine, or was no, it? Or, no. That was yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, so yeah. Yeah. Did you see gossip for that night? What else happened? Like a watch like that, like you said, brushing shoulders with slaves. Yeah. Um. Well, my favourite story was we. Well, I I was standing chatting to somebody, and I just heard somebody shouting Robbie, 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 and I thought it was the boys just trying to wind me up. So I'm trying to be professional and network here. It's Robbie, Robbie. And I turned around and it was the rest of the boys and Simon Pegg waiting for a photo. And it's Simon shouting, Robbie, I'm, I'm really sorry, mate. I need to go get a photo. I came over. He's like, what the fuck's taking you so long, mate? I was like, I'm sorry, Simon. <laughs> Moving on from brushing shoulders with celebs at event bashes, Robbie and Callum then explained the adrenaline rush of being asked to support Catfish and the Bottle Men. Yeah, yeah. That, that actually, they, so we were playing our last show with, um, only son and we got we got a dm on twitter um asking if we're free to support catfish and so are, are the boys free next thursday and friday well let me check my diary yeah <laughs> right, it's like because he's the t it's like the tour manager isn't I, th it? I think so and we're like we're like sure we know him from somewhere like but we weren't sure like it well, must have been like the tour manager's name didn't that? just his name yeah and then yeah. we kind of like realized this guy's like the the tour manager of like catfish and so straight away everyone's like, oh, yeah. well, like actually <laughs> mentally, and you're kind of like, well, it might not be that. It could be like playing like an after party or something, which would still have been like incredible. And then so like you straight away were messed about, yep, free. And then you're just waiting all day. Um, and I think it was after we played the flight, that show in Liverpool, uh, went outside, just like checked the message, and it was like, it's the support, like, Catfish yeah. on the next Thursday and Friday were just like absolutely mental. Because yeah. he actually he replied while we were 
Oh, we were um, and I remember like making eye contact with our tour manager Neil, and being like, like giving him eyebrows, <laughs> like as he replied. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so that must like you seem to just keep going this way. Is it, that would be an even bigger upgrade than venues? You were talking like oh, hydro, and, uh, yeah, yeah, hydro and P and J in Aberdeen it was just like incredible, but like so like frightening when you get out there. I mean, Hamish phoned. Because I think it, it, like me and uh, Neil were picking up like a photographer, so we were a bit behind, and my name was just phoned me, and he was just like, like, remember to switch your yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is like, this is like, like oh, well, you see, remember to switch your amp on. We like Wasn't when me. when we got on, um, like we like run samples with Gregor's laptop, right, and Reese triggers it. And he's like, Gregor, Gregor, your laptop's not turning on, and oh, somebody oh. knocked out the charging cable, so it died. Yeah. Um, so I I like crouched down because I like. Can I Where not... was this? Sorry, was it the high? No, this is the the Aberdeen first show. One. Aberdeen, Aberdeen, yeah. yeah. So what, um, like eight thousand, ten thousand. Yeah, I think 10, it, yeah. 000, yeah. Um, and so we like. Guy yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so like, but I'd like I normally kind of face away from the crowd, like for the start of the set, like it's just something I've always done. So I kind of like crouched down and did it. And then it took like two and a half minutes to the longest two and a half minutes. And I was cramping so badly, and I'm like, I'm not letting this go. <laughs> like, I'm not turning around until we are playing. Um, but yeah, I've never been so relieved to hear Reese doing the drum intro in my life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely great guys were Callum and Robbie, and I fully expect Dancing on Tables to really kick on once this whole COVID situation is hopefully over and done with. Moving on to our final episode, we welcomed author, life coach and public speaker Leila Khan onto the show. Now Leila was a great guest as well, very serious but very knowledgeable in her field. Also extremely welcoming and she was a great guest. She went on to discuss the impact that lockdown has had on mental illness. I mean you mentioned the whole mental health aspect yes. of it, have you noticed a, a big increase due to Covid and lockdown? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's honestly it's just heartbreaking. Um, I have a lot of people sending me messages and, and just, you know, sharing where they're at and how how difficult they're finding things. Um, it's interesting because with life, we can't control external circumstances. We can literally only control our vibration, you know, what we're thinking, how we're thinking, how we feel and so on. Um, school doesn't teach you this. School doesn't teach you how life works, you know. And so I think a lot of people are, in fact, I know that a lot of people are very, very um, anxious and they're falling into depression as well. And, and we can see that it's probably going to get worse over the winter time. Yep. Um, you know, so it's really about helping people to just acknowledge how they feel. And again, school has never taught us this. Society hasn't been set up for us to have the space to acknowledge how we feel. Yep. You know, and to to just be able to say, I'm I'm feeling depressed, I'm feeling really low, I'm feeling, you know, like I, I don't quite know how to carry on. Um, what happens is when we're feeling really depressed, when we're in that space, the mind creates quite a dark and grey and gloomy kind of, um, we'll go with mindset. Yep. And... We can actually shift that with the work that I do. So I'm a master practitioner of NLP. We can actually shift how somebody perceives, say, depression okay. and transform that into clarity or into hope or into um, inspiration. That would be actually a really good, a really good thing to work on if anybody's listening to this and feeling yeah. you know, that they are feeling depressed. When we're feeling depressed, we feel like we can't carry on and we don't we don't know how to keep moving forward. We don't want to pull the curtains. We don't want to eat well. We, we don't sleep. We don't want to go out. You know, we want to kind of stay insular in our own world. And what I would say to counteract that is to actually um, write down some of the things that inspire you. And it might just be one thing. Um, and try to write and add more to this list of inspiration Oh. and um, think about one or two things that you would like to do or like to be, right? And, and work through that list and look at this list and use that list as a, as a gauge to just lift yourself up higher. Yeah. Um, there is much deeper work with depression. Of course, I've been through, through depression. 
um, and haven't been since 2012, which is just amazing because pretty much my whole life I was in this space of feeling really low and depressed, but looking super, super happy. And then at times feeling really happy as well, right. you know, so it's that whole fake smile thing, right, okay. you know, um, but depression can absolutely be overcome for sure. Um, it's just a question of exploring that and be knowing and believing that life can get better and it's within us. Layla has her own podcast, YouTube channel, and she's even written a book as well. Layla explains how that book made it to Hollywood. Now this little book here that we've got here, Made it all the way to Hollywood, didn't it? It did. Looking forward to this story. Tell <laughs> us how this book made it to Hollywood. So it made it all the way to Hollywood. Uh, when was it? In 2017, 2018. And it was actually gifted to Ellen DeGeneres for her 60th birthday. Right. Which was just crazy in itself. And it was also gifted to 50 celebrities during the Oscars weekend um, at the Four Seasons Hotel in Beverly Hills. So, yeah, I mean, when that happened, it was just kind of crazy. So, you know how I was talking about manifesting money? Yep. I just love to manifest miracles and crazy things. And I was working in my office in Edinburgh and I got a message to say that, you know, this, this charity would love to have my book gifted. In fact, they didn't say Hollywood because I wouldn't have done it otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they just said that, you know, they wanted to gift it in, in these goodie bags. And uh, when I found out it was Hollywood, I nearly fell off my chair. <laughs> I was like, what? And it honestly, it took me two weeks to actually confirm that I was going to go ahead. Like, I could not say yes, because, like, self-worth, like, this was another level. <laughs> this was another level. It's like, oh, my God. Um, but it's been amazing that it's been out there and it's out in Hollywood and, and just reaching the people that it needs to yeah. reach. Because someone that you actually spoke to two weeks prior to doing that, Ellen had it in her hand, didn't she? And it was on Instagram, but you've struggled to get a hold of yeah, that photo, haven't you? exactly. Yeah, apparently there's a video of Ellen with my book in her hand on her show saying thank you. And I'm just like, where's this video? Where is this video? Um, and this was this girl who mentioned it. She actually said she saw it two weeks before meeting me. And that's how she knew me. And I was just like, okay, this is, this is random. This is out of my, you know, out of my hands. Um, but yeah, it's done really, really well. Um, and continues to, to be used in such a positive way. A very serious conversation, but Leila is so enthusiastic about her subject matter. She's really engaging and I loved having her on the show. Thank you so much, Leila Khan, for coming on episode seven of the Salt and Sauce Show. So that's it, guys. That's the curtain being brought down on season one. We are working extremely hard behind the scenes to make season two bigger and better, and we'll be back in the next few weeks. Like I said, that's it. A quick run through of some of the best bits of season one. Now, before we go any further, I really need to say a couple of thank yous, and it's not very professional, but I've written them all down because I don't want to miss anybody out. So, got to say thanks to all my guests. We've got Gareth Walk, Libby Emerson, we had Anthony Brown, James McDonough, Nick Mercer, Dancing on Tables, and Leila Khan as well. Thank you all so much for being part of season one. Also, part of season one was our chippies of choice. Don't want to miss out any of them. Thanks to Dino's in Lonehead. We had the Penny Cook in. Penny Cook. Uh, we had Sergio's in Poulton Hall, Mario's and East Coast Chip Shops in Musselburgh, Cafe Bicante in Broughton Street in Edinburgh and the Rosewell Friar in Rosewell. A big thank you to some of the guys behind the scene. A massive, massive thank you to Paul John Dykes. Big thank you to John Buckley and to Jerry, our camera guy from Rogue Monkey Media. Thank you so much, guys. All your help has been greatly appreciated. But the biggest thank you really has to go to you guys. Anybody who's watched even a minute of the Salt and Sauce show, I appreciate all your support and all the viewers who have watched the show. Hope you enjoyed it. Like I said, we're going on to bigger and better things in season two. There's so many exciting plans going on behind the scenes. I'm really looking forward to it and I can't wait to start back up in the next few weeks. So stay tuned, check out the social media. We'll keep you updated on when things are about to kick back off. But personally, one of my favourite parts of season one was when Nick Mercer pulled out his guitar and he gave us a little sample of some of his new material. And here's how it went. Take care of yourself, guys. I'll see you again soon. Yeah, this is one of the new ones, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Nicky Mercer with Irresistible. Amazing. Here we go. <laughs> One of these days, I'm going to tell you something, something that you can deny, by the way that it's moved in my life, it's irresistible, and all of your chains will be broken, no longer be hurt inside. Not defined by the way that 
And something that you can't deny By the way that it's moved in my life Thank you.